All right, so in this uh, lesson or Q&A, what we're going to do is we're going to go over how to modify shaders, particularly, correct me if I'm wrong, the Illum, mm -hmm. and uh, extend it to have our own attribute and have it change the, uh, the albedo slot. Yeah, so. pretty much. So what we're going to do is use a project setup and simply duplicate the shaders that the engine provides by default and then modify our copy of that. So what you first have to notice is that we have our project directory open. Make sure that you have your prior project and the assets directory available. So what we'll do first is we'll open a new file explorer window and navigate to the engine install. And this is assuming that you're using the CryEngine launcher. If you have a custom engine, you can use that as well. But then you'll have to navigate to your directory all by yourself. So, so we go to program files, x86, Crytek, CryEngine Launcher, Crytek, uh, and CryEngine 5.2, or any other build if you prefer that. Okay. Then we go to the engine directory. This is where all the engine assets are present, and open shaders.pack with 7-zip. What's worth noting is that pack files are pretty much uncompressed zip files and zip archives, that is, and nothing else. So these can be opened with 7-zip, uh, as well as WinRAR, but we prefer 7-zip as it supports this compression natively. We open that up with 7-zip mm -hmm. and can see the shaders directory. What we want to do is replicate this structure in the game directory. So we create a shaders folder. And then we search for the Elum extension file. Mm -hmm. So we'll explain what these files are in a bit, but first we'll just copy them over. Create the HW scripts directory, navigate into that in 7-zip, create the cryfx directory, and navigate into that, and then we'll copy ilum.cfx, which is the source file, and then common zpass.cfi. And then we can go ahead and close this. Okay. So what we have then are the shaders, so the extension file, as in pretty much the definition of the illumination shader and all the properties it exposes to the material editor, uh, and also this source file. So illum.cfx is the main source file for this shader and primarily contains the code for the forward pass shading. What, the reason we copied common Z pass is that we want to handle the deferred shading, and that's all done inside here. We'll go through that in just a bit. First, we'll start with opening up the Illum extension file. And seeing, just going through the file, we can see there are a bunch of properties here. So what exactly are these properties, and where would they be found uh, inside of the editor? Mm -hmm. They would be found in the material editor. We can show that quickly. So if we launch the editor, we'll actually see that the editor starts using this shader or these shaders instead of the ones in the engine directory. The general rule for CryEngine is that if the game directory contains anything that's also in the engine directory, we prefer anything or whatever is found in the game directory first. This way, games can always override content without having to touch the engine files, ah. which is very handy. So we can actually skip loading level, that's unnecessary. So we open the material editor. And uh, let's see, let's go for any material at all. So fog volume box. Uh, actually, no, we want something that uses the Illum shader. So maybe this is a material bad default. Yeah. Add it. The materials, material mm, default. Good one. Yeah, so this is then uh, a material using the Illum shader, exactly what we're modifying. And then scrolling down, we'll see the shader generation parameters. And these all contain the various flags or properties. Uh, that we then have exposed here. For example, so these properties that are exposed, they are strictly in the shader gen params, mm -hmm. or does anything actually cross over to a different part of the material editor? Or I mean, inside of this shader itself in the mm -hmm. material editor, there is there anything in there. outside of just the shader generation params in these? No, I think they're all in here actually. So you should be able to see, let's see here, detail mapping. Can we find it here? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so wait, detail. yeah, we have the detail mapping, the normal mapping though, that actually goes up to the other slots. It's not a specific oh, shader generation. So you mean the actual slots here? Yes. Yeah, these are specific to practically everything and won't be modified. However, we can access these in the shader easily 
-hmm. but we can modify the available slots. Okay. That's predefined. Okay, so now that we see all the properties here, what we're going to do is close the editor and start modifying the structure. What we'll go through a bit later is also actually the fact that we can modify shaders at runtime. Uh, however, we can't do that when it comes to properties. We can easily modify the source files, in this case being illum.cfx, and they include common setpass.cfi while the editor or launcher is running, but we can't add properties at runtime. So this has to be done uh, and then having the editor restart. So we'll add a new property, give it a name. What's a good name? Name equals uh, cry community. Cry community. There we go. And then we need to add a flag, so, or sorry, a mask. This is actually a, a bit mask indicating a unique number or a, a unique part of a number that then uh, defines the shader and unifier or defines where it actually is. In this case, we'll just add something slightly random that we know is unique and allows us to create this property easily without having to care about any conflicts with existing uh, properties. Then we'll also add a property name and say cry community test and add a description as well if you want that. So the description will appear when you hover over the property. So it's like a tool tip. Yeah, exactly. Uh, description does something really, really cool. There we go. Is there anything we need to do? No, that should be it. We could actually try start starting the editor to see if that works. So you don't actually have to connect any uh, attributes to it. You can just have the property, mm -hmm. which this will expose a checkbox. Exactly. Now this won't do anything at all now, mm -hmm. but it will tell us if something's working. Uh, you don't really have to load a level. That was more habit on my side. Uh, let's go back to the material default. Scroll down to the bottom, shader generation parameters, and there we go. Our community test. So whenever this is ticked and we actually render something, uh, also keep in mind that this was a read-only material, so we can't actually tick it. Uh, but yes, whenever we tick it, we end up creating a new permutation of a shader. This means that a new shader permutation has to be compiled, and it's completely different from another type of shader that has any other flags set. So uh, is there any performance hit or any uh, things you should take into account by adding another permutation? There is some concerns, but not really much. The primary thing you have to consider is that you always have to compile all these variations. So the way we normally work internally is that we have QA running through levels and then having a remote shader compiler cache all the various permutations that are used. For example, uh, something the remote shader compiler will notice when we see an object with cry community test uh, marked is that, okay, the Illum shader was used and it had the cry community test flag applied. Then it will store that. And then later on, when we're ready to release, we go through all these permutations and create an archive containing the compiled shader cache. Uh, this is done in order to prevent the user from having to compile shaders while starting the game. If you have a released game, you just provide pre-compiled shaders and nothing else. Okay. Very straightforward. So let's go ahead and close this again. And we can copy this string and go into actually common set pass. So what we're going to do is we're going to scroll up here and look which function we're in. So keep in mind, this is the, the, the deferred path and not forward shading. So maybe you can clarify what is deferred and what is forward. What are the differences between the two? So that's essentially they're very different techniques that we used to use in CryEngine. Previously in CryEngine 2, we used the forward shading technique. Uh, I'd leave that to a rendering engineer to actually explain all of it. I'm not too detailed in that. But we're now, or since CryEngine 3, we switched over to a deferred shading path, which essentially means that we defer the shading of certain things until the end, as opposed to doing everything in one go. So it's uh, more of an optimization technique. Yes, it has its benefits and uh, its drawbacks. For example, Transparency can't really be done uh, in a deferred pass. All right. 
But what we're doing here is we're going into the pixel class. Mm -hmm. Scrolling down to the very bottom. There's a lot of code here. You might be a bit intimidated, but we won't go through it just to keep our sanity. Uh, and just try to find the section where the diffuse map or albedo is applied last. So as we see here, at this point, we are done with modifying the albedo with all the various properties and then apply it to attributes, which is essentially what we send back. So what we'll do is we'll do an if here, checking, okay, if the cry community property is set, and if it is, we will do pedo equals half three, one, one, one. So essentially what we're doing here is resetting the albedo, disregarding everything that's been done above, for example, loading the diffuse texture, and assigning it to this and simply making it completely white. So keep in mind that this is a scale from 0 to 1, not 0 to 255. And that's pretty much it. Let's see what happens when we go into the sandbox. Keep in mind that if you want to revert your changes, all you have to do is simply remove the shaders directory from your project and it will revert to using the engine assets. Mm. Okay, so it's compiling the shaders for us. And then we'll open a material editor. Mm -hmm. Grab one of these objects. Or to duplicate as well. Exactly. So we get the material from the selection. And we actually had a duplicate here, but we'll remove that for a second. And simply right click what was assigned to this object right here. Also we'll zoom in to be a bit more clear. And <laughs> sorry, if we click correctly here, we duplicate. And then assign this so that if you notice here, the overridden material is default solids one and not default solids. Then if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll set cry community test. No, not allowed to. Might be that the flag we assigned was actually not unique. Yeah, let's try and restart the editor. We can actually save this while we're at it. And go into the ilum.ext file. See, could this be clashing? So what we normally have to do is actually check, okay, is this flag unique? Uh, is it not? Is there an issue? Uh, and this we do by simply going through the various properties that are used up here. What we'll lazily do is simply say, let's add another zero and start again, just to make it simple for us. And see if the flag then is fine. Okay, then if I can find my cursor again, we load the level. Select the object here, which was overridden. Open the material editor right here. Get the material. And hope that we can actually set this, which we can. There we go. And there we go. Now we have a completely white variation of the shader that completely dismisses whatever is in the diffuse mode. So doesn't matter what the texture is, we're overriding it completely. And that's it. And what exactly did you say at runtime you could change? Uh... Yeah, so at runtime we can actually change this and it will be updated. So what we could do is simply set the red channel to zero, and then alt tab back, have it recompile after having detected the file changes, and there we go. Change it's automatically set to green. That's pretty exactly. nice, actually. Yeah. Well, I think this covers quite a bit on shaders and, uh, well, a base entry point for shaders. Mm -hmm. We can have advanced methods in a bit, but uh, the introduction, I think, you went over pretty well. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the introduction, and I look forward to more stuff with you, Philip.